I am Kimberly Henderson, I'm SU class of 1996, and chair of the LEAD Advisory Board. I'll be your mistress of ceremony uh, for the Zoom meeting. On behalf of the university, it's my honor to host all of you today um, for this critical discussion, so welcome. I'd like to thank uh, Lisa Kloppenberg, SEU's provost, for joining us. Uh, she will share her remarks on how SEU is addressing racial justice and address questions during uh, the discussion. I greatly appreciate all of you for joining us uh, to explore how SEU is serving underrepresented students, um, in particular our students of color and first generation college students, as our students face numerous challenges as a result of the COVID-19 and as our nation um, and campus reckon with the long-standing racial inequality. We're glad that you have joined us um, to learn what SEU is doing uh, to support our first gen and students of color, but we also can offer you experiences, um, you, um, you can offer experiences, insights, and suggestions. Uh, this discussion will also serve as a call to action for us as well. Throughout this session, we hope you will uh, think about how you can be generous uh, with your time and with your resources. Uh, within this conversation, we will focus on underrepresented students in the, at SU, with particular focus on Black and Latinx students and first-generation uh, college students. Um, we also recognize the importance of all communities that make up SU. Um, before we get started with our discussion, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Father Shola, lecturer in religious studies, a uh, faculty director, and lead uh, board advisory member who will offer a prayer. Thank you, Kimberly. On this occasion of grand reunion at Santa Clara University, our hearts are moved to embrace the millions of people who are suffering the effects of global pandemic. But of equal importance this morning, we are painfully aware of the racial injustice that not only mars the promise of our nation, but also fractures the communion so deeply desired by this campus. In 1957, at the outset of his labor for civil rights, his pilgrimage for freedom, Dr. Martin Luther King shared with us the urgency of his vision, and it speaks to us today. Dr. King says, we are challenged to rise above the narrow confines of our individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. The new world, is a world of geographical togetherness. This means that no individual or nation can live alone. We must all learn to live together or we will be forced to die together. In offering this simple prayer, it is my sincere hope that it may in no way divide us by denomination, but that it may unite and ground us in a mystery greater than ourselves. And so let us be mindful that we are in the presence of holy mystery. Gracious God, your compassion and mercy are without measure and your goodness is without limit. We give you great thanks for the blessing, which you, for the blessings that you have bestowed upon this university community. Bless our students, our alums, our faculty and staff. Bless their families and friends enliven each of us with a spirit of rigorous inquiry and questioning and grace us with a reverence for your holy mystery. Dearest Lord, in the midst of our daily labors, never let us lose sight of the poor or of those who are being deprived their fundamental freedoms and voice. Make each of us an instrument of your justice, a guardian of your peoples, a builder of your peace. Teach us to be generous, to give and not to count the cost, to enter into the struggle for justice and not to heed the wounds, to toil for freedom and not to seek personal reward, except, O oh Lord, the reward of knowing your great love for us. Strengthen our hearts and minds so that together we may bring your good work to completion. For we ask all of this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, I'd now like to introduce Erin Kimura Walsh. She's the director of the LEAD Scholars Program. Erin. 
Thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, and I have a short presentation um, introducing the Lead Scholars Program and providing an update. So I'll share that with you now um, and share my screen with you now. Great, and thank you again, Kimberly, and thank you, Father Shola, for that, that beautiful prayer. Um, additionally, I'd like to thank our SU leadership who have taken their time out of their busy schedule today to join us. So of course, Lisa Kloppenberg, our, our university provost. Um, Kate Morris is here with us, our vice provost for academic affairs. Uh, Catherine Hines, associate provost for undergraduate studies is also joining us. Thank you so much for your work to support all of our Santa Clara University students during this difficult time, including our lead scholars. To keep a continuous flow to my presentation, I'd like to invite you to enter questions into the chat. We're monitoring that closely um, or provide your questions after my presentation. So my presentation will briefly start with an overview of how we approach our work with Santa Clara University's first generation college students. We'll then look at how we're addressing the immediate needs of our students in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as this period of racial unrest. Um, and we'll be looking at the areas in which we hope to further expand um, um, our services to our students. So at the core of LEAD are the first generation college students that we serve. Um, these are students whose parents have not graduated from a four year college or university. Um, and while they have their uh, first gen status in common, they're also a very diverse group. These are students from different racial and ethnic backgrounds, a wide range of backgrounds. 85% of our students are students of color, um, and many come from immigrant families as well. Um, our students have a range of socioeconomic backgrounds, but many of our lead scholars are from low-income backgrounds. So they, as um, K through 12 students, received free or reduced lunch at their schools. Many of, them, many of them worked as well to support their families. Um, these are incredibly bright and resilient students um, who are passionate about learning, but also face many challenges leading up to and in college. So when applying to college, many lead scholars don't have guidance in the application process. Um, and similarly, um, um, don't have, um, you know, family to guide them through what to expect in college and the transition process. Um, similarly, um, our students often lack the financial resources um, to do things like study abroad, um, participate in unpaid paid internships and undergraduate, um, undergraduate research. Um, so these are amazing opportunities that Santa Clara has, but often um, these are cost prohibitive for the students that we work with. Um, and approaching graduation, um, our lead scholars often have smaller professional networks um, and less available guidance um, in terms of their vocational discernment. So in response to this, we envision creating an equitable college experience in which first generation college students at Santa Clara are supported financially, academically, and socially to grow as people, thrive as students, and transition successfully into challenging and fulfilling careers. This includes that students have, have um, their basic needs met, such as housing and food, access to mental health resources, mentoring to help them develop a sense of belonging and esteem, um, as well as opportunities towards self-actualization like study abroad, internships, and research. So they can explore who they are um, and how they can make an in impact and fulfill their potential. So our program is really unique um, in, um, compared to other programs throughout the country. First, because of who our students are, they're bright, resilient, and determined. Um, with support from LEAD, they're highly engaged and academically successful and graduate at higher rates than the general Santa Clara population. They're also incredibly passionate about using their education to give back to underserved communities like the ones they came from. And lastly, LEAD at SCU is one of the few first-gen programs in the country that's truly a four-year experience. And I'll expand on this in the next slide. This diagram illustrates LEAD's comprehensive support of first-generation college students. First, we support our students in their transition to SCU through LEAD Week, our intensive orientation and peer mentoring program. 
We also um, ensure that they thrive by providing financial support that is offered via scholarships and emergency funds. We're providing ongoing advising and fellowships that fund, as I mentioned, things like study abroad, unpaid internships, and other opportunities, which can help to ensure their academic and co-curricular success. And we're preparing our students for careers with our vocational exploration courses so they can build their networks, explore their career interests, and build the skills to successfully apply for job opportunities. And we also celebrate these students' strengths and talents. We know that these students are an asset to our Santa Clara community and the community beyond SCU. We operate with limited resources, um, but we are among the select few um, of these programs that are providing this level of comprehensive support. Um, in the next few slides, I'll talk about how we're um, addressing the immediate needs of our students during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, early in spring quarter, we surveyed our lead scholars to understand the impact of the pandemic and our shift to online learning. 35% of our students, or about 138 students, responded, and we'll present this data to you, as well as macro data that echoes these trends nationally. So before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, many of our lead scholars and their families were already struggling financially, working minimum wage jobs, experiencing the challenges of economic inequality as it intersects with, intersects with historical and current structural racism, immigration, and lack of educational opportunity. They felt the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic immediately as they lost their jobs along with many others throughout the country. As a result, many of our lead scholars were in need of emergency funds as soon as the shelter in place was announced and that need continues today. Fortunately, LEAD was able to respond to students' needs immediately. We provided funding for um, last minute flights home um, and gas money to get home, as well as laptops for online learning. We also are continuing to buy, provide um, assistance with things like laptops, as I mentioned, as well as uh, money for rent, food, and other living expenses. Because LEAD regularly um, is providing emergency funding even for before the pandemic, we had the personnel processes, cash reserves, relationships with students, um, and relationships with donors to respond immediately um, as the university mobilized a more centralized response. Distance learning has also had a differential impact on our lead scholars. Our students are more likely to lack technology, internet access, and study space. Um, during spring quarter, for example, I was regularly checking in with Diane, one of our um, students who graduated this spring, um, and she was trying to take her final Santa Clara courses in a crowded one-bedroom apartment with five other family members, including her, her little brother um, as well. So this just kind of illustrates um, you know, the tight spaces that our, that our lead scholars are working in to try to complete their studies. Um, so I'd like to invite Gloria now, one of our um, lead scholars, to share her experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, she's a lead scholar who will graduate this December. Um, she's a Spanish major and a math and urban education minor and is planning to pursue a career in teaching. Um, this fall, she was our lead week assistant, um, helping to oversee our uh, first virtual orientation for our new students. Um, so I'll invite Gloria to share now. Hello, everyone. Good morning. It is an honor to be here. Um, so just to share a little bit perspective of what distance learning has been for me um, and some of my fellow lead scholar members. Um, it has been difficult. I will not. That's what I will start off with. We had to begin this in March and we're not sure if we're going to, back, going to go back to campus. Um, but one of the first things that we came to realize is how drastically our accessibility to resources has changed. Um, coming home, realizing we may not have the Wi-Fi, we may not have the stable Wi-Fi, um, the printing, the access to going to ask professors about everything. Um, that was really difficult. And other than that, I had to come back home and realize both my parents were unemployed. I myself was unemployed. Um, so coming up with rent, coming up with food, money for food was also a burden for everyone. And at the same time, having to focus on courses was taking a mental toll. Um, at the moment, I continue to have a part-time job. I had two jobs 
um, I'm overloading with 23 units and peer educating and at the same time trying to think about grad school. So it has not only for myself, but um, for everyone else, we share similar experiences where we have to go out and put our health at risk during this pandemic because we have to and we want to help our family and not so that the financial burden is not just on them. But at the same time, we want to keep up with our studies because that is very essential and important to us. Thank you so much, Gloria, for sharing your experience and especially for, for being here with everything that you're juggling. I really appreciate it. Um, so um, I, I want to just talk a little bit, you know, as you know, Gloria mentioned, right? I mean, there's so many challenges for our students during the pandemic. Um, and we're also looking at kind of um, deepening some of the areas um, in which we're providing services. And a couple key areas um, are mental health. So one is our students um, have really indicated, um, um, you know, that, that the COVID-19 pandemic has really heightened their mental health needs. Um, and these are, of course, you know, already complicated by issues of poverty, um, family stressors, as well as racism that our students experience both on and off campus. Um, so this, um, you know, this, um, this year we're able to op offer a virtual support group. We've offered racial healing spaces as well. Um, and we're looking forward to further expanding our mental health services in the near future. Um, so Gloria, do you wanna share just a couple thoughts about kind of, kind of your mental health experience or how things have been going for you? Yes, thank you. I do truly think that um, we are in need of a psychologist or a psychotherapist for just first gen students it is like I mentioned before going through all these experiences and everything being new to everyone takes a toll <laughs> it really does and helping having someone that we can talk to in particular is very helpful I came to realize that over the four years what would happen is that I would go to my friends and my friends would come to me and we would all form little therapy sessions <laughs> among each other because we knew we understood each other I think that's the main thing we knew we understood our experiences and where we were coming from. And that was most important because we had trust and we knew we wouldn't be judged. Um, being a first gen student in a predominantly white university and from a low income background, you, can, you come to realize that, okay, sometimes I feel like I don't fit here. I still have um, imposter syndrome that I'm going through that I'm trying to come overcome. And during my first and second year, it was really hard because I didn't really know what was going on either at the same time. Um, and I think that's another factor that, for example, in my household, we don't really talk about mental health. Um, so just knowing, becoming aware of what that is and what different ramifications of it are, it's important to talk to someone, I guess is what I'm trying to get to. And yes, it is really helpful to talk to our peers, but I think seeking help from a professional behaving better. Thank you so much, Gloria. So the next thing that we are really looking on expanding, and I know we're, we're running short on time, so I just want to briefly mention that we're also looking to expand um, our economic empower, empowerment vertical. So this is really looking at how we can, you know, as I mentioned, provide support and training for career exploration, you know, and hopefully at some point um, also um, beginning to establish pipelines around internship and job opportunities for our students as well. Um, I wanna briefly um, introduce Helen Casa, who's here. Um, I know that she took one of our vocational exploration courses and wanted to share uh, just um, kind of a little bit about her experience um, with that course. Hi everybody, um, my name is Helen. I'm class of 2020 Santa Clara University and I was also lead scholar. Um, and I actually took vocations in law, which gave me the opportunity to talk to a real lawyer and also get the perspective of what does it mean to go to law school and why I should. And actually in that class, we talked about why we shouldn't go <laughs> and to like, you know, debunk a lot of the myths around it. Um, and I think it gave me a lot of perspective in the sense that I'm glad, specifically for the law program, that there was a focus on why we shouldn't because a lot of people go for the wrong reasons. They'll start their first year and be set like $50,000 in debt and then never finish the JD or they walk into it thinking it's going to be like undergrad, but law focused and it's, it's not, you know, and explaining how to get scholarships, how it works, what to prepare for. And I took it my sophomore year. So it gave me enough time to figure out what are the necessary steps I need to take 
between now and grad school and it also gave me the time to not put all my eggs in one basket in case you know really instead of a, a JD I really needed a master's in public policy you know um, so in that sense it was really beneficial and effective to me and because of that class I decided to not go straight into grad school and work um, and that kind of goes into like the next slide that we have which is where I work, it's called the African American Community Service Agency, and I am um, their policy and advocacy coordinator there. And one thing that I'm realizing from this role is, yes, I, will, I think I will go to law school, um, but it's also identifying, you know, a lot of the things that are affecting the African American community in this area. Um, and it really ties into um, what LEAD provides and like what LEAD is working to resolve. Um, and one thing that LEAD is working to identify is, like Aaron said, which is more pipelines and more opportunities and more resources, but we're also identifying where those gaps are within the first generation and then also the campus community, and that is our students of color, predominantly our African American and Latinx students of color, um, and providing key resources such as like mentors, um, resume building resources, um, all the vocational classes, like I said, my experience was in the law one, but we have several different varieties of um, courses of that nature um, and identifying where the gaps are specifically with African American students and saying, do we need to create, you know, more programming that's specifically around this to build those types of uh, mentorships and relationships for um, students. Thank you so much, Helen. I appreciate you sharing your experience. Um, so I just want to, um, you know, just acknowledge my staff um, who's pictured here, um, what a great support they are. Um, and now I'd like to um, introduce uh, Lisa Kloppenberg, our provost, to share her remarks. Thank you so much, Erin. And thanks to our students, Lori and our recent alum, uh, Helen. Uh, it's really helpful to hear your personal experiences. So Thank you for being vulnerable like that. I'm honored to join this discussion today. Father Kevin O'Brien puts diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as college access and affordability among his top university-wide priorities. At convocation last month, Father O'Brien made the commitment that Santa Clara will be an anti-racist university. Many of us have joined him in that commitment. And I can tell you, I've been at SBU seven years now and it just feels different. The passion, energy, and action around many issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion is serious. And it's coming from many parts of the university. We know that it will be long, hard work to make systemic changes and make the climate better for all of our students, particularly our BIPOC and first-gen students but we're really energized and enthused to do that. And the LEAD Scholars Program, of course, spearheads that commitment to an anti-racist university every day. Since its launch in 2003, the program's evolved into a model for its ability to attract, retain, and graduate first-gen students. But that's not enough. It's gone beyond those traditional metrics to help students really realize their full potential as people and as professionals. In the Jesuit tradition of Majus, striving for the greater good, we've challenged ourselves as a university to think creatively and to hold ourselves to a higher standard when addressing the experiences of our first-gen students. This Zoom call is an example of how we're opening ourselves to your guidance, input, and critique. I consider this a vital exercise for any program to sustain, scale, and continually improve. In spite of the budgetary, budgetary shortfall the university experienced due to COVID, we remain committed to our students, faculty, and staff. And as Erin said, we've established emergency assistance funds and identified other resources to support our impacted students, faculty, and staff. While these are truly challenging times, the pandemic has also provided an opportunity for creativity and innovation in the way we engage our students in learning. In very short order last spring, every SCU student became an online learner and every educator became an online instructor. They learned new tools and skills 
with fabulous support from our academic technology and faculty development team. We listened to our students last spring, and the faculty and staff then worked hard over the summer to revamp courses and programs to make sure that we responded to students' needs in remote learning, our high standards of a personalized, transformative Jesuit education, even in this remote format. Additionally, as the world responds to racial injustice, we are taking stock of our own shortcomings at Santa Clara University. Father O'Brien has apologized for our sins, past and present, the ways in which we have failed to be just, equitable, and anti-racist. He's called for deep listening to the voices of our most marginalized students, faculty, staff, and alumni. And he's called for action to make our campus climate better. So let me tell you just about a few of those actions. This summer, we created the Black Excellence Scholarship Fund, which has raised over 300,000 in funds to support need-based scholarships for incoming Black students. We've also set aside additional resources to advance recruitment and retention of Black students, faculty, and staff. I'm really excited that we're seeking a new faculty member in this time when many universities are not hiring in our ethnic studies program and our winter women and gender studies program. We've expanded our inclusive excellence postdoc fellowship program and worked hard to retain our stellar black faculty already at SVU. We recruited very aggressively last year and we were able to bring in our most diverse class of new faculty ever. And we will continue that emphasis as we move forward. An experienced outside investigator is examining the incident involving campus safety officers, Dr. Danielle Morgan, her brother, and her family. Additionally, we are undertaking a comprehensive audit of campus safety policies and practices and that's led by a highly respected outside neutral, Judge Ladores Cordell, who worked as the independent police auditor for the city of San Jose. We anticipate her report by the end of the calendar year. We've also retained a trainer from the team of Dr. Jennifer L. Eberhardt, a well-known Stanford researcher on unconscious bias. These fabulous trainings began on September 14th, and I found the one offered to the cabinet members and deans really useful. She helped us focus on the impact of our policies and actions, not just any good intentions behind them. Let's really look at the impact. How are they affecting people disproportionately? Father O'Brien attended the training, that same training, with our campus safety officers this week. We've resumed the search for a vice president of diversity, equity, and inclusion. That was suspended in the spring when we all left campus, but Vice President Eva Blanco Macias is heading the search and will ensure that we get broad input from our stakeholders. Additionally, I'm very excited that many campus departments are holding diversity trainings and conversations among faculty, staff, and students. Father O'Brien and other leaders are listening to our students, working closely with the Inclusive Excellence Council and other affinity groups. The trustees are devoting a significant part of their fall retreat this week to issues of diversity, inclusion, and equity. And they've asked specifically to hear from some of our black faculty, staff, and students about their experience on our campus. And we're not just reading and talking. Many departments are engaging in concrete action. For example, changing policies that might appear neutral on their face, but have a disproportionate impact on black faculty, staff, and students. Let me share a few examples from my division, although I assure you that efforts are underway across campus, from athletics and orientation programming to alumni relations. So we're working on diversity in the curriculum and we soon expect to approve three new minors that our students can pursue in ethnic studies. Asian American studies, African American studies, and Latinx studies. 
faculty are offering new courses, for example, addressing structural racism. And most importantly, we're working with many faculty across all the schools on more inclusive teaching. We're hosting workshops, gathering resources, and being informed by our students. I recommend an excellent website, which Erin can put in the chat. It's an anti-racist teaching collaborative. And it's really special because our faculty and students in ethnic studies put it together. Um, the faculty and students work side by side on it. And I found it to be just a really excellent resource as reading lists um, and terminology. And any of you are welcome to access that. So I'm excited now to hear from you. How can we as a campus better support our students of color and first gen students and move towards a more just environment? Thank you, Provost Klappenberg. Hi all, my name is Alex Cabral. I'm an SCU alum, a lead scholar alum, and I'm currently on the lead advisory board. And we would now like to open this up to a community discussion. Before we begin, we'd like to agree on a few ground rules. This space is accepting of diverse perspectives and processing styles. We will practice attitudes of openness, respect, trust, and support. We will practice patience and deep listening. We will share the air, recognizing that while no one is an expert on every topic, every person has something valuable to contribute. And a few logistics. Please ask questions and voice comments, either audibly or through the chat box. If you would like to respond audibly, please leave a comment in the chat box along the lines of, I have a question or I have a comment, and you will be called on in chronological order um, that it appears in the chat box since we can't see everyone's hand raised on the screen. And as a reminder, we have a number of people on this call, so please remember to be brief when possible, keeping responses to one or two minutes. And if we are not able to address all comments or questions, please still include them in the chat and we will save the chat to share and for reference later on. So I'd like to kick off this conversation uh, with a question for you all. In light of what Provost Kloppenberg has shared and your own experience, what are your thoughts about what you've heard today regarding racial justice on SU's campus? And what can Santa Clara do further to further advance racial justice? It's a, a big question, so let it sink in and, and please um, uh, share your comments in the comment box or um, feel free to do a little, um, you know, I have a question or comment. I have a question uh, for uh, Lisa Kloppenberg. The training that was recently held, um, which departments were affected and what were some of the things that came out in the training? I know the doctor. Thank you, uh, Kim. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Kimberly. Um, the training's really neat. It's SPARC, and it's out of Stanford. They have a whole center. And um, a lot of things that came out is, you know, uh, the problems with colorblindness. We don't need to be colorblind. We actually need to look deeply at each other and know that our experiences are different because of our race or economic status or first-gen status, for example. And then, um, as I mentioned, I think one of the big takeaways for everybody is uh, the impact of policies and practices. You can have a very uh, neutral rule on its face, um, but you know, if it's really impacting women, people of color differently, then it, it's not just. And so really trying to look at behind the good intentions, because I think so many people at Santa Clara are nice and want to be nice and perceived as nice and you know we have to ask some tougher questions about yeah even with your best intentions what's the effect what's the impact of this on our students of color so maybe you don't address a question that's controversial in the classroom or controversial remark by another student because you want to keep it you know collegial and civil and all but what you're doing is actually really harming people by not addressing the racism in that comment. So, so those are a couple examples, but it was a really impressive training and just gave us lots to think about 
and work on. That's great. Thank you, Provost Kloppenberg. And I believe we have another question um, directed to you. How does the university handle hate speech? What is the stance on this? And is there currently a policy in place? Boy, uh, and I may ask for help from uh, Kate and Katie if, if they have more details. I know we do have a policy and uh, it, it really, it does, we are not approving of hate speech. We also are in California. So we also are bound by California's version of the First Amendment, which is really similar to the way the Supreme Court has interpreted the federal First Amendment. In my mind, uh, that allows for too much ugliness in our political debates and in our society, um, but we also have to be careful. Um, I like how Alex said it at the beginning, everybody has something to offer. We're open to different viewpoints. So, you know, how do you do that but also be able to, uh, you know, really go after people who are uh, engaging in hate speech. And so uh, we have uh, policy 311 for faculty and staff. And I know of a number of incidents, uh, which I can't speak about, unfortunately, because they're, you know, personalized, but where, uh, Claims were pursued and actions followed. Thank you. And thank you for the question, Christine. I, I hope that answers your question. Um, another um, question has come in from uh, Catalina. What support is the school giving the cultural groups and student unions on campus? Erin, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, I, you know, I, um, I, you know, I, we, we don't work directly with the multicultural center groups. Um, so I don't know that I could speak directly um, to that. I haven't heard about any kind of specific trainings or anything that's being provided to them right now. Um, I can, you know, I'm happy to check in with um, the Office of Multicultural Learning and, and follow up or yeah, on that question. Um, and that, that's the group that's specifically advising that group. So I don't know if anyone else has any anything to add um, as well, unfortunately. Erin, maybe I'll, I'll add one thing, excuse yeah. me, which is I, I know there is a lot of training uh, being offered through OML. Uh, the leader there, Dr. Joanna Thompson, is a criminologist and she has a lot of expertise in the area of um, like police profiling. So she gave a great training to, I think you were part of, to the extended provost uh, division on that. And I know she's been going around to a, a lot of the schools and working with the student groups on, on these issues. I actually think over the long haul, the whole process of ASG funding should be looked at, uh, again, for disproportionate impact. Um, but right now, frankly, uh, everything's happening by Zoom. It's less expensive because the big cost uh, is often our dinners and our spring gatherings, and, and we don't know if we'll be in person for that this spring. But I do think that equity issue among student groups is one we should be looking at. Yeah, Gloria, did you have a comment as well? Gloria is involved in some of the, um, the student groups on campus. Yes, um, so currently our multicultural center, the MCC that's right across from the bookstore, um, that's where most of our uh, multicultural groups gather weekly and we do need funding for the groups themselves and also for the center. Um, most of the thing in the center itself are kind of outdated so just making sure we have a space that we can welcome students of color. Um, I think that's really important and also more advocacy or helping if the university could help our multicultural groups um, be known to the outer community, um, what I mean, like outreach to other students, outreach to alumni, um, because we are a minority on campus. That's really helpful, Gloria, and I'll just say that um, we are working on improvements to the MCC space. Unfortunately, a, a bunch of that was like 
over the summer and nobody's been able to see stuff yeah so that's one of the problems of being remote but i really appreciate what you say about it's both kind of a, a comfortable welcoming modern space as well as the outreach and connection professional things and all that and i will just point out that we have a new space um, for our uh, it's like the multicultural space but it's brand new. It's going to be in the Toronto campus for discovery and innovation. And we've worked with our diverse students in STEM, but it's welcome to diverse students across campus. And it's a really cool space, uh, you know, really to gather those student groups. There's a lot of minority affinity student groups and women in engineering groups in, in that area. Hi, my name is Trudy Talaferro. I was formerly the Assistant Director of Student Resource Center at Santa Clara University, serving the African American student population there from 1988 to 1992. I'm also a graduate of Santa Clara, graduating in Counseling Psychology and Education in 1992. Uh, I'm listening with big ears um, and thinking that one of the, the key factors in this whole situation, especially with African American students, as I found, serving the new population coming into campus without any um, former uh, college education in their family, was that they needed a place to dump their concerns. They needed a place with a listening ear and faculty connections as well as university um, hierarchy connections, which I served to do for those students during the period of time I was there. I was also the person who took on Igwe Buike as uh, well, the student, the student uh, group that could go to the university and go to their concerns, to black students' concerns. I really think we need to reinstitute something like that. I'm not suggesting that you rebuild a student resource center. But it's pretty clear to me that African American students in particular want to talk to other African Americans about their race, uh, their racial experiences at the university before they go out and talk in public or before they go out to the larger university. This can be a way that we can train students how to do that most effectively, how to be heard, how to listen to what's being said to them. I really believe that we need to look back as we push forward and make sure all of the students' concerns are included, especially on racial and hate speech and uh, activities that impact them. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy and, and Gloria and Provost Kloppenberg and, and Catalina for, for the original question. Um, Noting time, I believe um, Eduardo S. had a question. Hi, right, yeah, um, sorry about that. Um, first off, thank you for uh, organizing this uh, great uh, conversation. I want to ask a really quick question. Um, so from my own personal perspective, uh, it feels like whenever I notice these conversations of uh, injustices, whether it be racial or any other kind of um, challenges that we seek or that we, um, that we combat, that it's usually a matter of like preaching to the choir, the people who are in these conversations are already aware of the you know challenges. So really my question is, um, what can we do more to like further uh, getting the conversation in front of people who are usually not aware of it? Is there some sort of like ethnic studies requirement that every student has to take? Um, is that something that can be evaluated or looked at? So thank you, Eduardo. I think that's a very wise comment, um, and it is a, a problem that kind of circles back all the time. So uh, I'll say a couple things. On ethnic studies, you know, we do have a diversity requirement, but we're going to redo the core. And so this is actually a big topic. And so I'm excited as we look at a new core, how, how might we uh, do that? But I think it's also, it's not only requiring students, you know, to take courses. It's like, how do you infuse it in philosophy and biology and law and you know across the whole curriculum too? So we're working with faculty right now on that before because reforming the core is a process that'll take a couple of years. So we're trying to work on that immediately. The other thing I'll mention um, in a way that we're trying to reach beyond the choir is um, that 
faculty, because of COVID, you know, took an online course this summer. And we had over 400 faculty do it, so way beyond the choir. And it was about how to redesign your course for remote learning, but a big part of it was about inclusive teaching. And so it was really cool that I love that inclusivity in the classroom for all students was a focus of it. But I agree with you. Great, thank you. Thank you all. Great questions, and I see we have many in the chat that are that are asking um, about initiatives on campus, um, uh, you know, different types of interactions. Um, I wonder if I could also add in another question that, that maybe that will lead into a, a wrap up and, and ask what else the Lead Scholars Program um, can do to further support first generation students. And, and maybe Erin can touch on this or, or those experience that, see, that have seen gaps um, on campus or with your experience with Santa Clara. I think I'd just like to thank both Helen and Trudy for their comments around supporting students around their racial identities. Um, of course, that is something, you know, we always are thinking about the intersectionality of our students, right, and who they are, but definitely have been thinking, you know, very carefully. And I, you know, I was a student when the SRC was around towards the end. I graduated in 98 myself. So I remember the impact and Kimberly and I have been talking a lot about that because we were both students. Um, um, and at the, at the time that the SRC existed and really thinking about, you know, that, um, you know, being an important thing um, and this being a, a um, important time to kind of circle back to that and really be carefully thinking about how we're supporting the racial identity of our, you know, of our first generation college students and all of our students um, on our campus as well. So I think that is one area that I'm really thinking about how can we do more to support our students around their racial identities. Um, so I want to thank, yeah, both Trudy and Helen again for those comments. And I'd like to uh, thank everyone for joining. Maybe I, th I think Kimberly froze. I think she froze. So uh, I think she was going to jump into the call to action. So Alex, did you want to just wrap up this 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 portion? And the lead advisory board, um, Provost Kloppenberg, can um, can and will review, um, and um, we'll be in, in contact if there are any follow ups. I'm sorry. And I might just jump in. Sorry, Kimberly, we can't hear you, but. Um, this is Lisa, and I'd just like to say thanks to Kimberly for helping, and, and to Alex and Aaron and all of your colleagues, Aaron, the lead advisory board, our alumni who are here today. Thank you so much. The students need you. They need you as role models. They need to know you survived SCU. They need to know you have a family or a career, and you know they need to learn from you. So as we close, I just want to thank you for your continued engagement in LEAD in Santa Clara University. We need your help in becoming an anti-racist university. And so we are gonna listen and put this action and these questions, ponder these questions, turn them into action and uh, move forward with your good help, support and prayers. And Lisa, thank you so much. This is Giselle Nunez, I'm class of 97, uh, co-chair of the LEAD Advisory Board with uh, Kimberly and also a member of the Board of Regents. And we're not done yet, everybody. Broncos, here's your call to action. The call to action is in the chat box. We need your time, we need your resources. We're trying to raise money for emergency funds for our lead scholars. $10,000 is our goal. If everybody chips in $500 today, you can use that link. We're also trying to raise money for the new Black Excellence Scholarship as well. $500 per person, we can raise $20,000 total, just even with this group. So that's number one, dollars. That's always important, I know, and I hope it doesn't turn anybody off, but that's our reality. Uh, Aaron's group, Elite Scholars, has given out $20,000 just in the past few months to, um, uh, to be used as emergency funds for our students. Number two, 
Do you have connections to your networks? We need uh, access, more access to internships. So if you have access to internships, you want to introduce your company to uh, lead scholars, I'm gonna type in Erin's email, send her an email, it's right there, so that she can, so, so that she can have a conversation with, with you. And then third, think about how you can stay involved in Santa Clara. It's great to see you at the Grand Re Reunion, but how else can you contribute annually, I mean, monthly, uh, bi-monthly, with your time, with your knowledge, um, there are many, many, many different boards that you can, that you can join. Um, so again, Aaron can help, um, can help you with more information or here, here's my email address and we can chat and I'm sure that I can help find a place for you to get involved on campus and be a more regular face among uh, our, our, you know, Bronco community. So with that, those are our three calls to action. So $500 each today, please, if you can't do that, 100 but 500 internships connect us to your companies and three consider staying more involved throughout the year with santa clara so with that i'm going to turn it over to is kimberly back on uh okay she she's she dropped so aaron do you want to just close it out i think lisa kind of closed it out for us already but yeah she she did a great job closing it out i mean i'd love to if we could if you are able to um turn on your video real quick if you don't have it on i'd love to get a screenshot of us um for social media to get the word out about this event um and our calls to action so hopefully we can get more um alumni um, on board as well so if you're able to to do that i'll take a screen um, I'll take a screenshot real quick. Oh, uh. great. And one more. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, but I just want to thank all of you. You know, it's so wonderful to see, you know, new faces, familiar faces um, joining us today to hear your insights, to get you engaged. You know, I look forward to having more conversations with you. If you want to continue the conversation, you know, Giselle, you know, put my email in the chat. Do not hesitate. Um, there are, you know, opportunities to just learn about, you know, what's going on on campus, but also get involved with the Lead Scholars Program. We're looking for mentor, you know, mentors um, for our students. We're looking for um, folks to get engaged in a range of ways um, with with the Lead Scholars Program. So, I and you know, again, you know, as Lisa mentioned, just thank you so much for your insights and your input. And you know, we are continuing to think about how we can improve both both our our broader campus as well as Lead Scholars Program. So, thank you so much for for joining us. Thank you, everybody. And don't forget the links are in there for your donations because we're good Broncos. We always ask for donations. So thank you. <laughs> Adios. Thank you. Adios. Great to see you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Wonderful. <laughs>